Okay. Uh, you know, I'm so glad I'm, first of all, thank you so much. It's, it's a very long time since I've been in Moscow and uh, the opportunity is great. Thank you, Lev, for inviting me. And it's great to follow Professor Yeomans because, you know, so much that she showed us has served as inspiration for the theory I want to explain and develop for you today. There's one thing uh, that I find necessary that's not clear in what we've seen so far. I find it necessary to always think in space-time, not just in space, and I'll try to explain why. Uh, so this is work by my graduate student, uh, Matt Gudorf and myself over you know, a number of years. And uh, I would like to emphasize some computational challenges that we as a community uh, have to face going forward. And uh, so this is one version of this work which emphasizes more computational aspects. But conceptually, there is only one thing I want you to take home, and it really has motivated my thinking already when my friends and I were in Moscow as physicists. I was also in Moscow as not a physicist, but as a physicist, definitely this was sort of thoughts that were very important to us then. And the question is simply that, when you, whenever you look up at the clouds, you see uh, Navier-Stokes equations being solved in real time. Now, do you believe that there is a supercomputer in the sky that takes Navier-Stokes equations initial condition that says dugga, 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 and that's the cloud that I see? No, no, that's not how the nature works. And I would like us to also change the way we work as applied mathematicians and physicists and say, let's do it like the nature does it. And I'll try to explain in detail what it means. Locally, you know, every little volume of space-time has Navier-Stokes equation encoded. They're very elementary. You can teach them in a class in, you know, one or two lectures. Uh, they come from symmetries and, you know, similar, very simple assumptions about molecular physics. What's hard is to solve them globally and for long times, but locally they are very simple. Uh, and we have run into this problem in the last two decades. In the first decade of this millennium, we had great progress in being able to solve in detail and numerically exactly in Navier-Stokes equations and understand much about the structures we see in uh, local Mogorov number of turbulence without any statistical assumptions. So these are Navier-Stokes equations in front of you. Uh, the experiments are just amazing. You know, it is one early experiment. Now, more recent experiments can get the three-dimensional uh, structure of velocity fields, vorticity, etc., with the accuracy that is indistinguishable from uh, uh, numerical calculations. So that is just an example from what's currently a lab in Austria. And there are also beautiful pictures. Uh, we have made great progress. And about 10 years ago, we hit the wall. And the wall was that while we were very good in solving Navier-Stokes in small spatial domains, we've been absolutely unable to do this where we really care about them, which is for very long pipes, very large shear flow surfaces, aeroplane wings, all kinds of things. And the reason is a little bit like what happened in plasma physics. Instabilities are so vicious. I'll give you a little sense of them. That's impossible to compute the way we've been computing in fluid dynamics. Now to illustrate this, Never Stokes is a little bit too fancy. When I talk to my plumber friends, you know, hydrodynamicists, I, I am only allowed to talk about Navier-Stokes, but applied mathematicians and physicists also allow me 
to think in one dimensional version of them, which is called flame fronts. So Neville Stokes's equation about a vector field in three dimensions, but that is a perfectly legitimate, you know, description of what happens on gas rings, bunts and burners uh, burning in a time, and that's one dimensional theory. There's also burgers, but I won't do burgers today. And basically you have one velocity field, that's the velocity of the flame front in one dimension. It has convective term as uh, Yaman said. It has other terms and usually there is a, you know, the viscosity term. In Kuramoto Shioshinsky, it's used to pump energy in, so it has a wrong term. And the things are controlled by hyperviscosity, which is Laplacian square. And, you know, it's a system that people do care about. There's a huge literature on it, so we have pretty good intuition about it. And if you put it on computer, that's what it looks like. You know, it's very suitable to understand the concepts of what we want to do, just like uh, it was in active matter situation. Uh, but we can explain what space-time looks like. So this is the physical spatial extent of a Bunsen burner front. So imagine circle and there is a gas burning around the circle, a ring of fire. This is time going forward in time. And you can use color scheme to explain the velocity. So red is velocity moving toward you. Blue is velocity moving uh, away from you. And once you have seen these pictures for the rest of your life, and everyone shows you any Navy, you know, Kuramoto Shivashinsky picture, you'll say, ah, that's Kuramoto Shivashinsky. And I'll explain why you can do it even uh, you never see it again, it's turbulent. Now, how we solve it, and that's my emphasis today, is, you know, we are unable to put infinite space on computers, so what we always do is we compactify the space uh, in a ring, and for Bantz and Bernard, this is even conceptually right in their experiments, which are compact in spatial domain, they have circular symmetry, and we run code forward in time to infinity, so we have time evolution. And that's uh, uh, what we do, you know, because we have spatial symmetry, we use uh, Fourier modes in space. So we get a bunch of coupled ODEs. And when we integrate them, we get something, with, this is a very long run for natural units of the system, a small ring, size 20, good enough to get few of the wiggles which you saw in the big uh, area I showed before. And you know, typical time is of order 20, 10, 20, but we run it to 1000. And what's striking about all this turbulent flow is that no matter how long you run them, they always look the same because they do the same stuff. We call it steady turbulence once we're in some kind of equilibrium, far from equilibrium steady state. Now, what I want you to take home is that you also have to think of space the way you think of time. Uh, particle physicists are used to this, but not our sub-communities in physics. And uh, the basic idea is in any direction where you have continuous symmetry, time or space, you should treat them democratically. What I mean by this is that I can take the same equation, Kuramoto Shivashinsky, with all kinds of derivatives in time and in space, and I can turn it to the side in that plot, uh, space time plot, and uh, I can turn it into first order uh, differential equations in spatial derivatives just by you know, stacking them up as first derivative, second, third. What you do in Ham when you go to Hamilton's equation, for example, momentum, velocities, and extra degree of freedom, you do this, you get four equations. They're nonlinear, they're coupled. And now uh, they're first order in spatial derivatives. So you can think of them as dynamical system. You know, there is a vector field of fields, and there is a law of how they change. Uh, you make it compact and only natural thing when you have translation variants periodically compact in time. You specify initial data at fixed space time point. You in specify 
the state of the system for all times on this compact domain. And you put it in computer, and what do you know? This is how we usually do. We have a compact domain in space. We run it in time. And, uh, uh, but uh, my graduate student, Matt Gooder, specify initial conditions for an instant in space, but for all times, and integrates it sideways, and you can solve PDEs that way as well. Uh, you're maybe not used to it, but because both space and times are invariances of these equations, you can choose either one to integrate. In other words, um, we are able to compactify time and integrate in space, but it's hell. And, and you know, we are used to the hell in time and we're given it a name, we call it chaos. So we say, well, when we integrate in time, we have exponential loss of accuracy. After some time, which we call lapuna of time, because we call everything after lapuna of that lapuna of didn't do. So after some time, there's a horizon and we have lost initial information, but because this is steady turbulence, you know, pictures look the same, but our integration has nothing to do with initial condition. Same thing is true in spatial integration, and it's even more unstable. It's just crazy how unstable it is. So Matt is only able to run space for very short times compared to what we want. You know, one or two wiggles in spatial flame front before exponential instability kills. So this forces us to rethink the whole thing from scratch. And the lesson is you should always think in space time when you uh, address turbulence problems. So, you know, what's the basic idea? I mean, you look at this and uh, if you have a sleepless night, as graduate students often do, you take scissors and you say, you know, I look at the large space-time simulation Kormata Shevashinsky, if I look closely at the small domain, I see the same thing over and over again. You know, every place there are these little things which in active matter would be called topological defects, but you know, I have several roles joining into one role, etc. So shouldn't we understand turbulence by understanding these defects and how they interact? Uh, and the way we do this, is actually what we have always been doing in real calculation. We compactify not only space and time, but we solve uh, our partial differential equation, our field theory on compact tori, periodically space-time periodically domains. The idea is that if you have the solutions on the small domains, they will shadow what we see on big domains. And we move the old theory of uh, chaos, you know, due to, let's say, Ruel and uh, Gutzwiller and uh, group in Copenhagen, etc., cetera, uh, was that chaos, you cannot simulate it forever because everything falls apart. But if you find the hierarchy of periodic orbits between Bedic and uh, Godic C, if you determine them, they're there for infinite time. So they're actually describing infinite time asymptotics. And you organize them as totally, that's called periodic orbit theory, and you can learn on it by looking at book on chaos book, clicking on it on the internet. The new version of the series says every time I have continuous symmetry, space-time symmetry, each symmetry has to be counted in. So now we have to look at spatiotemporal tori and see whether we can cover the ergodic space using those objects. And now, how do you really do this? When you're on torus, then you do Fourier transform in two directions because you have spatial invariance. And you discretize it because you only have computers of finite size, so you have to discretize it. And uh, you get a set of algebraic equations in which Time is gone because you Fourier transfer it away. Space is gone because you Fourier transfer it away. And what you're actually doing is you have a bunch of large dimensional, large dimensional means 100,000, which is no big deal in uh, 
today's calculations. A uh, fixed point condition, you know, you have an equation that says every field at every site of your discretization has to satisfy a tangent space condition. Uh, now, uh, what's beautiful about this theory, we already know this in evolution of time, we do not choose what periodicity is happening in time. Nature chooses. So if you do, uh, you know, some strange attractor like Lorentz attractor, nature tells you how long it takes to get around and come back. But same true in space. So uh, while so far we had to artificially uh, compactify space domain or time domain. In this calculation, nature compactifies them for them and tells us what the natural periods are. So in the new version of solving Navier-Stokes and all other equations is uh, we live on two torus. It's discretized. It looks like a fish stocking. It has time space on it. And we are looking for solutions on that. And there is no more time evolution. Nothing is growing up exponentially. There is no more space evolution. Nothing is growing up exponentially. These are extremely robust calculations. And what I mean, at least for full field theorists and statistical mechanicians here is that you have discretized time and you have discretized space. And you are trying to find a field globally on the whole uh, spatial temporal periodic Torus, which satisfies at every point local equation, which is what Newton and Leibniz gave us, the differential equation, so there's a tangent manifold. And that's what you do. And I think you'll have to do this in future. You know, think globally, but act locally. Make sure that law is obeyed every place. Now, there's an unexpected gift on that. Uh, Doing Navier-Stokes uh, solutions in the first 10 years of this millennium, we had to go to absurd accuracies. You know, we had to compute Navier-Stokes. Engineers are happy just to show you a picture or have 10% accurate solution and they get tenure. But physicists had to compute solutions to one part in 10 to the 11. Why? Because solutions are very unstable and to find recurrent solutions, you had to have very accurate initial conditions to come back, even for very short ones. So we were, had to write all codes from the scratch. We had to reinvent all, you know, how one computes because exponential instabilities are so hard to beat. But now it's just good to know the shape of the solution, you know, whether topological defects and active matter and you get few percent accuracy in a global solution, but you get the correct topology of the global solution. And how do computations, I imagine, of the future work? Some of them are already there. So there is one very basic idea which is common in engineering, so it's an optimization problem. And it's common in uh, particle physics because it's called Lagrangian. Yeah, so. Uh, but basically, what you do to solve equations spatiotemporally globally, I'll explain it just in one time dimension and no space dimensions, is that, you know, the law of motions say that the local tangent field in this example derivative with respect to space is uh, given by some vector field. Newton gave you equations of motions or Hamilton equation of motions like, look like that. And um, you would like to solve them. And you know that you expect to have two defects going this way and something else happening. So you understand the topology of your solutions. I can make a global guess what it's supposed to look like. That's this red line here. And what's wrong about law about guess is that it's every place somewhat wrong because the law of nature says I should be moving this way, but my loop, which is a, you know, a law of nature to tangent to my global solution is pointing the wrong way. So what do you do? You define, or stupid version is you define cost functions slightly more intelligent if you have variational principle. Uh, you know, it could be Lagrange or Bell-Jacobi or something. 
But basically, you add up squares of your errors and you write some code and minimize this them. And what this code does is it says, your guess is bad, let me improve it. Let me anneal it to the correct thing. And it works like charm. And the truth is, we have all of been doing chaos calculations this way because it's impossible to find long orbits any other way. So that's the main idea of computation. And now I go back to what do the clouds do? Well, clouds do precisely that. You know, locally, everybody knows the law because these molecules are adjusting around me and, you know, I have to preserve mass conservation, velocity, momentum, this and that. And that's called Navier-Stokes equation. Uh, and everybody knows locally that's what we have to do. And you jostle with your neighbors if they're misbehaving and you all get you know, locked in and that's a solution and that's what the clouds do. That's how they solve major stuff. There is no supercomputer in the space. There is a billion cores connected to the neighbors, both in future and past and left and right or up and down. So, you know, uh, you turn every equation into so-called Feynman equation, which means you take all the terms, put them on side, and say it's equal to zero. Kuramoto, Shevashinsky look like that. Then you minimize the cost function, but there could be infinitely many smarter ways, and that's why I'm talking to you, because you might think of better ways to do this numerically. We need your help to do this. Uh, but, you know, for Kuramoto, Shevashinsky, we're able to do it. For never stocks, we really have big challenges ahead. And to show you how these variation methods work, first, you know, we have some solutions because we have worked on these problems forever, which are doubly periodic. And we destroy them. You know, I take a double periodic solution which goes from you know plus and minus two, and I add noise to it, which is hundred percent. This is this left thing, so it goes from plus or minus four. And you can see that there is some kind of remembrance of the old solution, but basically noise has destroyed it. We stick it in this variational optimization program that Matt Goodoff has written. And what do you know? It just goes and finds the solution. So we know that uh, we can find known solutions. We can make guesses of what solutions should look like just on scaling arguments, you know, what wavelengths are dominant wavelengths. We stick them in this and this works like charm. We find solutions and um, we can take large domains and put them in equalizer and they produce totally credible Kuramoto Shivashinsky looking solutions. And now we are in this very embarrassing situation. Matt has thousands of solutions. It's a huge library that he has produced. And what are we to do with all this stuff? Uh, and here comes the idea that, you know, is obvious when you, for example, look at Yeoman's, listen to Yeoman's talk. Uh, you know, how do you, you look up and you say, ah, that's not a cow, that's a cloud. Now, that's totally weird because you have never seen that cloud before and you'll never see it again. Yeah. So how can you recognize the object that just, you know, blimps at some moment in uh, history of the world and never repeats? Because, you know, turbulence, the main feature is that things are never the same, you know, keeps changing all the time. Well, you know, you do this by being blind, you know, what you really see is the parts of the cloud and they look around and look like this. So you're recognizing the, you know, building blocks of the clouds and you say, well, you know, that looks like a cloud to me and not uh, a cow or you know, a bear or whatever. So what we have to do, and we have been doing this for generations in, in, uh, temporal chaos in chaotic systems, we have to develop symbolic dynamics, uh, what uh, Yasha Sinai and maybe Kolmogora, will, I don't know who introduced the term, but it has a long tradition in Russia. Uh, we have to find a qualitative description of what we see, give names to various shapes, build alpha and glue them back together and see where we can explain what we see, explain turbulence, in that way. 
So how does that work? Out of this, you know, library of thousands of solutions, Matt takes one and say, look, you know, to me, it looks like that this thing repeats twice. Now, this is a doubly periodic solution on a torus. He takes scissors, cuts out this block here. Now, now it's wrong because it's no more periodic in this direction because, you know, uh, it just isn't. But you stick it in your variational calculator in the sense to a doubly periodic solution which to naked eye cannot be distinguished from this subregion. Then you say, well, you know, this looks like two things glued together. So let me cut it here, run it through my variational solution finder. Indeed, there is a solution like that. Then you say, well, you know, there seems to be a symmetry. So let me look at, you know, anti-symmetric half run it through my variation solver, bingo, you find a shape, which is a very simple shape, a wiggle, but seems to have shown up four times in this solution. And uh, you do this in lots of places. So this thing that Matt cut out many places, we call it defect, you know, it's a topological thing, if you wish, where uh, two rolls glue, you know, get glued into one. There is something that uh, Matt calls God, but basically there is a wiggle. And there are things which are very boring, which you see, which are called uh, streaks. Uh, you know, they don't seem to change in time. And, uh, you know, once you have them, you use space time symmetry, reflection symmetry. So this seems to a good starting alphabet for this infinitely complicated turbulent picture. It looks like if I look sufficiently close, there are only three shapes I see. You know, either it doesn't do anything, or it wiggles a little bit uh, in space time, or it you know dies, glues, joins, etc. Now uh, then we can find the solution, and you know I take just some example of a little bit more complicated shape. And but every solution that you find does, it tiles space time because it's doubly periodic. So that solution is true every place in time and every place in space, but it looks very unphysical because no turbulent system ever looked like that. You know, turbulent systems look like this, not like that, right? They're changing all the time. So how do we deal with that? Well, you know, we have found our tiles. We can tile space time with little blocks. So let's use them. And that we also know from uh, chaos evolution in time, we're used to this idea that a long time trajectory is visited by various shorter periodic trajectories. And that's how we construct the symbolic dynamics. We say, when it visits this trajectory, it's a neighborhood A. Now it's gone to Strogana, you know, now it's gone to Landau Institute. So these are various names we gave it, and we say that's itinerary in time. You can do the same thing in space time. So use these three letters we had before. You glue them in uh, various uh, ways. So on the left hand side is a very coarse, very wrong starting guess because not only are periodic boundary conditions not respected for the whole torus, but everywhere in the torus you're mismatching your guesses. You stick it into your variational solver and what do you know? You get a solution of Kuramoto Shivashinsky that has all the shapes built in. It's perfectly nice. It's smooth as baby ass. There is nothing wrong with it. And uh, you have a name for it, you know, besides what you want to call it, but you know, there are various streaks, these domains, or, you know, give them uh, letters two, one, zero, whatever. So you can construct them and you have to get used to this idea that this, these are rubber tiles. They have to be a little bit deformed to match, but that seems to work. And uh, now what has happened? What has happened is totally outrageous. Now, if you're not, no linear dynamicist, you might not care, but it's a 
difficult for lots of other people. And that is, in the future, there will be no future. Goodbye. You have to give up on your time integration forward in time. And that also applies to Professor Yeoman. Uh, you have to really think in space times. All these integrators that we developed over decades with so much pain and love and PhDs and tenure jobs, they're useless because they're all killed by exponential instabilities and you cannot kill in exponential instability unless you, you know, act, uh, think globally, act locally, as I'm trying to explain. They really don't work, they were cheap. So, uh, what we have to do is we have to find possible global shapes and enumerate them and build up libraries of these things. And then when we see a phenomenon, we can look in our library and says, you know, we saw this plan of Moscow, this part of Moscow has been realized. And uh, now you can ask, well, it's already expensive to integrate something forward in space. I mean, time if you have it in space. So can computers do this? I think not only can they do it because we have done it at least for one dimensional PD on you know, laptops and small workstations. Not only that, but we also um, won't have any other options in future, I believe. I might be wrong, but that's a computational thing. This is a dated picture from Ingerman Bergman, Max von Sydow playing chess with death. You know, I'll teach you how to win. And for details are in the book. The answer is that the things that we have now, we can scale them up. And there is a whole kind of engineering, applied math interface of uh, engineering and physics literature in place already. Uh, I should uh, emphasize Shiki Wan's contributions, which is, they have discovered, I say rocket science because this is aeronautics department and such departments. They've realized that if they're going to get computation forward in time, we cannot anymore uh, rely on proce processor speeds. We have reached limits for processor speeds. What we can rely on, you know, bearing quantum computation during some miracle, what we can do is we can buy cores. They're getting very cheap. So if we cannot improve individual core, but we can buy millions of them. And people have already noticed, like Shikivan, that uh, if you code your space-time lattice when you're so solving Navier-Stokes in such a way that you don't only connect yourself to uh, codes, your neighbors in uh, local uh, processors, uh, local cores, not only in space, but also in time, you get much more robust computations. And currently, I think they're comparable in price, forward in time simulation or space time simulations. Now, somebody like me and uh, my friend from Blondau Institute have big dreams. You know, we always said we made bets whether you know, Young Mills is integrable or not long time ago in Moscow. And uh, Navier Stokes for us is a very clean system to train ourselves on. But, you know, we care about young mills, we care about gravity, so we care about classical, strongly nonlinear problems. Young mills, I think, eventually will be there. For particle physicists, what I'm saying is kind of quite natural because they've always lived in space time for a century. People who do turbulence and chaos have been stuck in Newtonian way of, you know, absolute time. This should be over. And one thing, we will not be able to make a graduate student recognize the shapes because already for Navier Stokes in three dimension, this is becoming impossible. So, you know, machine learning, 
of which my colleagues have started into this, will be totally essential. We won't be able to solve any of these problems by human visualization of three-dimensional vector fields at every point of three-dimensional space-time. You know, all of it for Neville Stokes, it's kind of really mind-boggling to do this. We do it, but it's hard. And I'm telling you, it's not enough to have a snapshot. You have to have space-time. You have to have videos. So they'll be impossible to do unless computer help us. So I think that's what computation of future is changing. Uh, and I'm sure you'll do it. And we are back to clouds. You know, take home of this is how do clouds solve problems? They don't do it in Newton and Leibniz way. This has been outmoded since Lagrange, but uh, certainly since invention of special and general relativity, we work in space time, we live in space time, and we have to do this even for classical problems like Neville Stock turbulence. And it's very natural. It says every core is a, has a little Neville Stokes equation coded in it. It solves it and makes sure that it agrees with its neighbors. And that's how the whole thing comes together. Now, we as people who want to understand it, we have to classify all possible solutions and give them names and then describe phenomena in terms of our vocabulary. It's possible to do because there's a finite number of distinct shapes for small ones and the larger ones are glued together so their number grows exponentially with the area. And it turns out because of the shadowing, that's not so bad. We can use a finite repertoire that we know the time evolution, called, it's called cycle expansions and time evolution. We can use short area data to get very accurate computations of any average we need to compute in the systems. To, so to summarize, uh, I, I beg you to try to, and it's really hard, you know, it's hard for me. It's almost impossible for my graduate students to step out of the straitjacket of time being absolute and space being space. But actually, you have to describe phenomena not in a snapshot, which is an instant in time, you have to always describe them in videos, which is a space-time sequences. And lots of people in neuroscience, in uh, you know, pattern recognition, character recognitions know this. To give you just a simple example, already from the 1980s, uh, when they wrote first character recognizers for post office, uh, you could train machine to recognize nine digits by giving that pictures. But if you train machine to recognize the way you write those letters, so space-time sequences for letters, you know, recognition, robustness, accuracy goes up by factor 10 to 100. So instead of 90, you, pre, you know, recognize 99. Same thing in neuroscience. If you give snapshots of monkeys and neural activity and instance in time, it's very hard to make any sense out of it. If they perform tasks and you look at space-time sequences, uh, even though this is, you know, million dimensional state space, you get beautiful signatures of what you need to do. So this is how we have to think about all the problems which are complex, turbulent, have many, many possible choices, but can be built from smaller blocks because of invariance of the laws. You know, the, every monkey follows the same neural law, even though the wiring is slightly different at all times. And in our case, in all space, we have some spatial symmetry. So get out of thinking in time uh, and think about it like people do for Ising models. You have to enumerate space-time solutions and you can do it. The technologies have gotten to the point. Not only that, the technology, only technology of the future will require you to think this way because we will not be able to, you know, speed up as we did in the last 50 years. More law is over. Anyway, I'm done. And I'm proud I managed to do this. This is like Denmark. I did it in, uh, you know, 39, 38 minutes and a half. Yeah. So, yeah, good. Thank you, Prednok.
Yeah, and I have a little thing I can write on. So if you ask me a question, I can doodle answers on it because I lecture online. I spend all my life preparing stupid lectures. <laughs>